Thank you very much for being here tonight. It's a very busy time of the year and we very much appreciate your interest in the work and in this conversation. And um, I will start introducing our speakers. You also have a little bit back on the brochure which gives you their bio so you know who is sitting here tonight. So I will start with the very old fashioned way I will start with the number also her name was the A, so it's only appropriate to do so. Mitra Vastur on my right, uh, she's a curator of photography, associate curator at the Department of Photography at the Museum of Modern Art, and also a scholar, a teacher, and a specialist of post contemporary Middle Eastern art, among many other things. And on my left is, I'm in a very strange position, I'm trying to have to perform a deepest photograph. And on my left is Magla Tanya, who is probably very well known by many of you because he is the founder and the chief critic of Hyperology, the blog which during the past few years became a very important kind of resource for reading reviews, thinking about art, and um, I assume that it receives tons of hits and tons of hits. <laughs> okay, so. And before I kind of start saying a few things about the show very briefly, and then I, we, can, we can launch into this conversation mode here. Also, five out of the seven artists are here tonight, and I would just like to introduce them and to acknowledge their presence here, and also to tell them that although it's the three of us for about 45 minutes, 50 minutes or so, but they should, and they are extremely welcome and very encouraged to pitch in with comments because of their work we are talking about. So they have the privilege to speak up, and then everyone will have the same privilege after we open up for Q&A. So, where do I start? I will start with the people I see. Um, I see other artists, but I'm not calling on to them. Uh, Monica Siladi in front of me, um, with long blonde hair, and her works are the montage here and there. And also an earlier work on a can on the way down to the staircase. I'm not sure how many of you saw that. Sarah Lubair, um, with a second in the, in the row, whose three photographs taken in Forest Hills are on the left side of the wall as you enter into the exhibition space. Um, Felix Sid is right there, wearing a white jumper. And then um, he is the, the artist whose work, the large scale, uh, the digital montages, the black pictures, black photographs are displayed on the right wall as well as in the back. Manal, where are you? Manal Abushahin, right in the first row. Um, she made a sleeper, the very, very large uh, nude on the black wall after Sarah, Sarah's pictures, and also the tiny little tank, the very landscape um, up there on my left. And Peter Baker, sitting right there in the back, who did the Bronx Stadium, the Yankee Stadium picture, as well as um, the two kind of street scenes, um, one with the four gentlemen and orange shoes and the baseball thing, and the other with the blue panels. And two of the artists, unfortunately, are not here with us tonight. Yorgos Prinos and Harvey Slovans are already back with their loving families in Greece and Croatia. <laughs> so they are in absentia, but their work is on the wall. Harvey is on the back, and Yorgos is in the corner. Okay. So that was the intro. Everyone knows who is who, or at least the artists are called on. And um, before I would start asking a question from me, and uh, right here, I, the, the thing I want to um, say is that. Um, how did, I, how did I come to this show? Because although I am very gently, a little bit maybe over generously, um, my name is all over the catalog and also in the wall as a curator, and I did indeed choose the work, uh, participated in the hanging, and had the pleasure to write a catalog essay, which I'm actually really proud of, to be very honest. But, um, but the show was not my idea. This is a show which was not you know, top to bottom, but it was generated by the artists themselves. Felix Arsid was the initiator of the show, I believe, originally. Uh, he kind of asked friends, colleagues, um, all of them went to Yale, all of them graduated from Yale's, um, you know, MFA, photography MFA program. And then someone who is not here with us tonight, Karolina Choynovska, who is on a plane right now, en route to Warsaw. Uh, and who did this quite uh, informative and rather useful 
interview with the artist included in the catalogue after the short essay I wrote, uh, Karolina Choynovska was also instrumental in kind of working with Felix on the exhibition. So I came in a late phase, I chose the work on the wall, but I already had a list of artists who preferred and that kind of chose themselves to be presented as a group. And the first question I need to ask immediately, and that's for the panelists on my both sides, that door makes tremendous noises, um, is, is there any common threat here? I don't know, I'm a little bit blind to the show, which doesn't make me a very good moderator, maybe. <laughs> but do you see, can you kind of discover any sort of common thread, shared sensibility among the work? Because the institutional affiliation, right? Having an MFA in photography from the Yale, you know, art school might not be necessary enough. So can we kind of think about the work collectively as a presentation or display? And then we want to Sure. I was going to say that I didn't think there was one unified thread. I mm -hmm. think there are definitely groupings, mm -hmm. um, and I think one of them is the sort of, uh, which I see as sort of a dominant thing that's more and more like a photographic object. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's that definitely a tendency to sort of treat it like an object, and I think in the show you can obviously see the fact that that's a perfect example mm -hmm. um, of, of, of a photograph that sort of, you know, sort of emphasizing the objectness, yeah. you know? Um, and then there, there is, um, there's definitely the sense of maybe a heightened perception. Mm -hmm. I think that's something that is another thread that I see. What do you mean when you say heightened well, perception? Well, for Felix's work, um, I think that that's an example of like feeling like you're seeing something you wouldn't necessarily be able to see if you were standing there mm -hmm. or standing in that sort of position. But then also in the case of um, Sarah. uh, Sarah's work, it's you know this sort of this sense of this sort of magical light that appears that you know probably was never there or you know like it's just or at least there's this assumption where where that um, you know where there's something you're seeing that isn't necessarily there and then I think the other tendency for me would be sort of this more um, street documentary mm -hmm. kind of uh, mode that sort of have, that has been going on for a while but it's just you know sort of it's a continuing tradition mm -hmm. um, and I think in the back the works by um, Peter and then also, Your yeah, and I think also um, there are a couple of Peter's definitely, and um, even I think Monica's too, the one over there has a little bit of that kind of aesthetic, the sort of, you know, this moment on the street. So that, I would say like those are the three categories for me. Uh -huh. Okay, we try to pretend. I want to go in on the street pictures because I know that many artists, although they do work, in the street, but I, I wanted to think about this street photography important, not important, what does it mean to work in the way of street photographers, but I'm just curious if Mitra has anything to add or to comment on that. I'll table my comments on street photography for later because when I was reading the catalog, I thought, I'm so curious, I don't remember thinking anything about street photography when I was in there, and then I came back and, so anyway, but. The thing that I think is the most unifying thread, or the thing that really struck me, is there's something very, very present in terms of a visual tension in, in all of the work. Mm -hmm. And that visual tension is, and, and I don't think this is entirely the curatorial imposition or the title that's shaping my thinking here, but more really understanding the process of all of the works and then looking at them. There's something very precise about this tension between what we see as fact in front of us and what seems to be not quite right. There's a uncanny quality to a lot of the work throughout the work. Mm -hmm. And it's in and it and what's interesting to me is the diversity of ways that that's explored in this across the mm -hmm. different artists. And so for your ghost, for example, you have really quite straight photographs of people on the, on the street that have been cropped <coughs> so tightly that it's in framing the gesture yeah. in a very precise way that you get your, it begs the question, what's the narrative or what's the subject that you get the mm -hmm. sense of, of mystery in uh, Manal's work over here, I mean, 
in Manal's work, the nude over here, it's in the lighting. In Sarah's work, it's in the lighting. Of course, mm -hmm. there's something interesting about lighting here. In works like this by Peter, it's in that tension, be and, and I would say in Felix's work as well, there's a tension between where, where the straight photograph is and where the montage is and the fact that that's mm -hmm. reversing your perception. What appears straight mm -hmm. has been montaged, what appears pasted in is straight. And that's the kind of, mm -hmm. there's a very precise visual tension and it's that you sense it even before you know what it is. So like in talking to the artist or in reading about the work, you can uncover the secrets behind the magic trick, but the feeling that like innate uncanniness is something that's communicated expressively in all, in all of the work. The other thing I would say just very quickly is that one of the things that's very interesting to me is the number of art that in a couple of the artists work, Carboya and Manal is a good are both good examples that that these two pictures or these two, this triptych and this diptych are from the same body of work mm -hmm. that we could consider, I don't know if this is true at all, that nude and this photograph from this same body of work. There's something really interesting in like that that's how this artist is represented in this show. It, we wanted to break things up, so you know the fact that Manal's sleeper, a very, very large scale color photograph of a nude in an interior is a cross of her black and white straight picture, right? Uh, taken in the street of Beirut, and both have what we call uncanny, or something out of joint, some kind of what you can call, I call that, but I meant it in a political vein, the catalogue referring to Ariel Lazule, that there is a gap between the life and the image, there is a gap between the word and its image, and um, and what you call uncanny. The only reason why I'm a little bit kind of wary of the uncanny because it brings in a bunch of kind of surrealist connotations. And although I do believe that thinking about you know the surrealist uncanny is not an improper thing to do, but um, I mean it that way. Okay, we will talk about that more. But you know there is something. So I'm actually very happy that you know you had one modality which is so either formally or conceptually which can be played or kind of noticed or recognized in all the work. I want to go back to this for a second, because I have a really good quote from here. Um, yeah, from the catalog. Uh, I prepared a few notes, and most of my notes and questions are actually based on what the artist stated in the catalog, because I think that we absolutely don't have to disagree with it. With no offense. You respectfully for everyone, but I think it's a really, really good way to start thinking about how do they think frame their practice and how does their kind of own words help us to think about the work further. So this is a quote from Peter in response to Kaya Karunachoinovska's questionnaire. And I will quote, I find somewhat amusing that the first question people often ask about my pictures is, are they staged? It's not so important. And this happens to be actually a sketch photograph, I'm giving it away. Um, but it's interesting that we do have a tendency to read it as if it would not be. So my question is, is this really true? Does it matter for us to know when we look around this picture, what is staged, what is straight? Because sometimes we see the montage in the work of Moni, you know, the two edge or behind on the wall, and also in Phoenix where uh, the montage quality is very obvious, it's very much part of how they look and what they do to us. But here, is it important to know? this flashback to this conversation I had with Peter where I was convinced that it was a composite photograph and then he told me that it's straight no, like it's coming back to me. But I can clearly convince myself again. And I guess that's like, that's, that's the uncanny, that's the tension, is that like, the nude is a straight photograph, but it has the, the lighting is such that this is a straight photograph, but the, the scale. framing yeah. of the contemporary commercial of the urban scene creates this sense of incongruity. Mm -hmm. And but so there's a so there's different ways that each artist are are like mining the tension of the uncanny in the environment around them. Does it change it for you to know that it's straight? 
Um, if it's staged or not, not really. But I think that kind of, I think that uh, sort of speaks to people's, people trying to understand mm -hmm. value yeah. and quantify it. It's sort of like, you know, when you see a painting, people often ask, how long did it take you to make that? And you know, with photographs, there's not really that question. No one's like, how long did it take you to photograph that? Yeah, right? you, that. you get that? <laughs> really? I mean, I'm kind of surprised, but it's like, but I, but because I think they often see you put it together, maybe. As opposed to like the white one off. It's like I feel like in their minds, sometimes people kind of trying to justify the value of something based on time. So yeah. often I think the idea of stage is like, oh, well, they didn't just take the photograph, they also set up the, like there's this people often trying to read meaning and value into because the image. time equals a sort of certain notion of labor. Right. Which in photography exactly. is already problematic, right? I mean, because what does it mean? What do we mean by labor? What does it mean by execution and realization? Right. And it's no wonder that in the case of Mooney and Felix, it comes into comes into question because if it's a montage, yeah. we know fully well that it means that someone takes a bunch of pictures and then sits in front of a computer really long and meticulously failing, trying, failing, trying, kind of you know tries to put it together so it becomes a different image. But I'm just wondering that for me, and that's a public confession here, for me it's sort of important to know how it was taken. I want to know how it was taken. I want to know if it's straight, I want to know if it's uh, staked, I want to know if it's manipulated, it's what expands. Because maybe, like most of us, I'm a little bit too rooted in what Max Kozlov called once a long time ago, but it's a good phrase, the, kind of the testimonial function of photography that it is rooted in the real somehow, more directly, that photography does have a reference in the real, um, even when it's obviously pictorially engaged, like Felix's work, and obviously it's a fiction, like Moni's montages, we still know and want to see somehow this real transcribed or, you know, appearing on the surface. I think, I think that's the difference, though, between, let's say, a curator, a collector, a critic, because I think with the critic, like the, the, sta the stage thing, I think matters a little less. And I think that's because when you're looking at a work, you know, the intent, an artist's intent can often interfere with your looking. Do you know, it's sort of an art historical thing. And it's like, so, you know, I don't, I want to be able to like go up to an image. I mean, because we're a contemporary audience, we should be able to like go up to an image and be able to understand it, you know, if you have some sort of like background or like being able to, and so I feel like, this, I, the question of whether it's staged, even though it's intellectually interesting to me, I really don't care because I want to see mm -hmm. the image, I want to see the object, I want to see all these types of things. So for me, it's not so important. Mm -hmm. I would say, like, the idea, so this idea that I feel is very present in the work of, of some kind of visual tension, some kind of visual tension that I'm calling the uncanny, that's how I respond as a viewer, or as you're calling it, this sort of critical. That's my instinctive uh, personal response and the conceptual side, the academic side of me wants to think about that in terms of photographic vision in a, in the sort of way that Mahoney Naj or Ruchinko or the modernists of the 1920s would talk about how photography gives us a, a way to see the world that is distinct from our, our eyes. And it can do that in, a, in many ways, right? So the photogram was for them a way that you see an object presence on paper, it's material presence on light sensitive paper. It could be through montage, it could be through multiple exposure, sandwiching negatives, it could be through taking a film strip and interrupting the illusion of it capturing real life and motion and printing it as a contact strip. And so like there was, and so the person, my personal response to this work is that there's this pictorial tension that expresses an uncanny. My academic response is that uncanny is manifest as a series of contemporary interactions with photographic vision. And so I would say like here, in Yorgos's work, in Peter's work, in Yorgos's work, we're talking about how framing can alter or interrupt, create a visual tension in how we see the straight scene in front of us, now that I've been corrected. In Felix's work, we're talking about how montage can 
really explode the way we look at at identity crap, you know, how it heightens our vision. One of my favorite works by Akram Zatcher is this montage he creates. Um, it's called Something May Something 1982, and it's a montage of just snapshots taken with a point and shoot camera that he's pasted together like you make your vacation panorama into a long landscape. And so they don't line up precisely, and it's a series of rectangles. And it, the, in each rectangle, you see the smoke, the explosion of a bomb that has landed as, as the town of Saida is being shelled by bombs from the south in 1982, in the middle of the Lebanese War. And he talks about this panorama as being the truer, this montage of individual snapshots as being truer to the experience and truer to the lived day of that event in his adolescence than any one documentary photograph could have been. Like, okay. that's, mm -hmm. that's the truth. That's the documentary picture. And I think there's something of that kind of how can the manipulation of or the use of photographic vision, the use of the tools of photography change and give us a, an expressive vision of the world. I think that's really interesting, that the idea of truth versus like reality, like full, like, like sort of this sort of documentary reality. I mean, definitely in Felix's work, you kind of get that sense where, where you know, that you know that that's not real, quote unquote, but it's very real in terms of knowing what it's like to see these sort of masses of people and sort of like doing all these kind of random things simultaneously. In that way, it's more real. Right. Do you know? A what true you know? expression of being in the middle of the bias yeah. or the two bias the, 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 yeah. the two and they lay of the word true uh, and truth, but I think that what you're saying about the, the military photographs, are they montages or they're collages and adjacency of the images? It's like eight, six snapshots, but out of your point of shoot yeah. camera and you pasted them. Okay, so so it's not a montage in a sense, it's not a flawless kind of surface, it's more a kind of photo collage, it sounds to me. But it's very, very interesting about it that it is about disruption, so it denies the kind of fake continuity or flawlessness, what a topologically continuous photographic image gives you of an event. It kind of you know makes disruption, right, into physical. Uh, if you look at Monet and if you look at, and we can talk about montage, and then I will say something about whether we need to know the image or not, uh, because I'm going to come back to this because I think that you both have too much faith in images. That's <laughs> <laughs> not a good thing. Uh, no, if, if you don't want to know what it is that you are looking at, you believe too much in, in you know, what's within the frame, and you think that images speak, speak for themselves, and I do not actually believe that any image would speak for itself. Do you think that, you, someone has to speak for them? Uh, yes, I think everyone should speak for them, uh, whoever is in front of them, and I think that, you know, I don't think that images are always a little bit empty, you know? Um, I, you know, they, there are no full images. Empty? Maybe yeah, I do have a little bit of my position. Because if you, know, if you turn around and look at hardware, and if I, you know, you tell me what you are looking at, um, I always thought it's a body. The first time I saw this word, I thought it's a, it's a body. It looks like nipples for me. It's extremely sensual. It's even sexy, right? Uh, it has an incredible light, and I learned everything. Uh, really? <laughs> Maybe just me, but let's not go in there because then it's going to be too confessional, way too public. But I do think that it is important to ask the question what is in front of you and, and kind of not to believe what, what's in the image itself alone. But back to the montage. I would like us to think about montage here because, and then um, uh, to come back to the idea of truth and reality, what uh, you brought to the table. Because um, if montage about disruption, <coughs> both Felix's work becomes a sort of disruptive experience. Moni's work is also about disruption, social disruptions, also kind of mapped visually, spatially, right? And it became, in the case of Felix, but also in Moni's, not in every work or differently, it becomes an overload of information. So it replicates a sort of experience, which is an experience rooted in the real, despite the fact that the image itself is not that of the real. So, am I making sense? Yeah, sure. 
You don't have to say so. <laughs> so I want to think about, you know, I also want to think about, you talked about our history and objects and photograms. We did mention montage. So when we think about montage in relation to historical precedents, how this were different from those. And when we think about, you know, media, other media, object, you started saying that there are, There's you know, an object. Objectness. Uh, you mentioned the diptych and the triptych, which are very painterly, pictorial things. Uh, Manal sleeper, I do see a lot of painterliness in there. Felix calls those two works black photographs in reference to Goya. Right? So what do we do with this idea of the object, the pictorial, or the montage existing you know, in relation to photography? Are those works which rely on something extracurricular? Right, not just photography or planes. No, I, mean, I think they've been part of photography from the beginning. I don't think any of that. Yes. I mean, a daguerreotype is an object, and we treat it like a, like a, an object. And it know. should be because it's a unique thing. Right? right, exactly. But I meant, but even other objects that are not necessarily unique, I mean, I think we still treat them that way, you know? And I think, I think, I, I think we're dealing with a lot of assumptions people make because they're photographs, you know? And I think that's mm -hmm. kind of, we so almost have to, like, make, make sure people kind of get rid of those, uh, you know, preconceived notions, like this, how simple it is to take a snapshot and all these types of, so I don't, I don't, I think those were from the beginning to deal yeah. with photograph. I don't think there's been ever a moment where those weren't part of the discussion about photography. But do you see those things informing these pictures here around you in any way? There's, I mean, there's history in every single one of these photos, if not the artist's history. There are so many examples, I mean, you know, the, I mean, without a doubt, I mean, the, you know, Think of this photograph here, and think of um, I'm trying to think of like issues of scale, and I mean even you know whether it's like a Robert Frank to like you know I mean, there's Abbott. so many. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, exactly. Like that's a great example. Bernice Abbott would be a great example. I mean, it's there are there are elements of that kind of issues of scale and like you know where where things are coming from sometimes, and sort of this mon in this case there's like a monumentality to it that's sort of like a little deceiving. And you know, so, I mean, all of them. I mean, I, we could probably go through at least 10 examples of, you know, in the history of each image mm -hmm. and, and how they're... How they're I wasn't so much about, you know, thinking to make a historical inventory of what informs these pictures. I just, I was just curious that, you know, how can we differentiate them, you know, because I do actually see a very obvious kind of, you know, desire on behalf of everyone to kind of, the way you display the artist shows, it's very interesting. Me, who frames, who doesn't frame, what is the scale. We do know that all of these choices are extremely important. So you can think about scale, you can think about, you know, an object who's putting things into a box, tilted against the box is a choice, choosing, you know, diptych format, diptych format. The case to make them kind of stand away from the whole. So I do think that the display is actually quite important here. And um, that's something very new that after photography became rebranded as contemporary art, right, in the 1990s and the 1980s, that we don't even have to talk about photography per se, we can think about contemporary art. So your examples doesn't necessarily have to come from, you know, Mohan Inad or Barony Sabot or... True, but, the, I mean, but I also like to think that all these, all these artworks also have multiple lives. Like, they exist in a gallery, but the reality is most of us see them as two-dimensional objects on a screen or mm -hmm. a book or something. So, I mean, they also exist that way, you know, in very, like, I think the first time I saw some of these works, or, you know, it was on a screen. I mean, and, and we make assumptions about an object, we make assumptions about an image that way. So, you know, as much as, you know, this sort of, like, they all sort of started creeping into the gallery, that, that became the de facto place one shows contemporary art, you know, and, and then issues of market get play, and all these types of things have, have played a role in there. But I don't think images have one life. You know what I mean? I think that's where it's like they have many lives, and that's where the this that's why in a gallery the objectness for me is so important. You know, as mm -hmm. objects, I mean, I can't stop seeing this one, for instance, as an object, even though people are ta you're talking about the image, but I keep seeing it as this sort of object in the gallery and how it's being presented. Um, you know, and that that kind of comes up to me at first. And I would say very to build on that, very important to this idea of of what the we can't talk about photograph as an object being a new concept. Yeah. It has existed. We can't talk about photograph as montage being an invention of any time. It's existed since the invention of the medium. 
But what is also true of the medium of photography is that it's a, always been a rapidly expanding technological toolbox. And so the tools of photographic vision do expand over time. And I think one of the things we do see in some of this work is even though we might draw a very clear in terms of both subject and um, technique, the ideas of cropping, framing, of the interest in the contemporary, modern, expanding, transforming landscape of Beirut. I mean, this is very much what, this is very much a contemporary image yeah. it's about not, a, not only in the fact that it is of a contemporary landscape, but in how, in what that disjunction of scale means for the landscape, the, the way that they were just felt. But what we can talk about is the new tools that are being used here. And some of those are absolutely rooted in digital photography and color, digital color printing. Yeah. And a lot of the way that this kind of, um, we're experiencing the image is in the material process of the photographs here. Mm -hmm. And we would experience that differently on a screen in a book, et cetera. But even in the, on the screen and in the book, we'd be seeing reproduction of something that was taken digitally, printed digitally, that has a, a resolution and a saturation right. that comes from the digital photographic vision. And so I think Sometimes we want to think of digital as being Felix's work. We want to think of it as being digital manipulation, but it's in fact an entire, or, or Monica's work, the ability to take and Photoshop and montage in a new way, in a digital way, but it's also a material fact. It's a, it's a well, color. It's a dematerialized, de it's, it's in a one way it's dematerialized because all these images actually exist as JPEGs, which is of course, it's, you are basically the third generation of photographers who most of you started with analog, but your work, your graduate work and since your graduate studies, you are working with digital. So your mature work, you know, your, your whole career is based on the digital, it changes everything because there's a dematerialization of the file. I think it, it's a very, it's a very peculiar thing, right? That the objectness of the original thing does not exist because it's really a kind of, you know, packed file. Which you can send online. The digital files do I was great. going to say, I was going to say, yeah, I would know that. The amount of time I spend, I don't know what's the amount of time I read, spend reading The Economist or the Sierra Club <laughs> magazine, but I'm a good believer in the materiality of the digital, you know, like the um, yeah, these zeros know that. and ones exist in a file format exist, the machines, right. the servers, the the screen that it requires to read the zeros and ones. Yeah, and actually it costs yeah. more money to migrate digital the files, as you know, than, you know, dusting of the contact stuff and the negative. So digital kind of creates its own tremendous institutional issues in terms of archiving, etc. So that's not a question. But what is interesting that almost as the kind of oppose that, I think that there is a certain idea of how the display, the three-dimensional display of the work becomes much more important because modalities of display, right? How things emerge or appear not online, not as an image file, which becomes a new way of dissemination and encountering the work, I think is makes even more important to have to show the work when it is not a JPEG, when it is not on a screen. You want to say something? Tiny and orbs. <laughs> sure. That would be an example, sure. Like, what was it, Jewish yeah. giant? Yeah, that, 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 that photograph, you know, has a little bit of that, exactly. I mean, you could go on, I'm sure. Except that there is no ceiling here. To come yeah, that's true. Make him, make him duck his, make him duck his, duck his now. Peter, I wanted to ask you, did you want to follow up on any way about the straight versus um, stage and your kind of, you know, belief that um, you don't find it important? When someone looks at your work, you have three straight pictures in the show, um, all the three requires a very long looking, if one is interested in knowing what they are, so that's how you know what's going on. Well, the first thing I would say is it sort of feels, in listening to this conversation, it's very interesting, that, that for, you know, I think I can speak for my peers to some degree, some, as working with photography now, all of these questions we're asking, it seems like the first hula hoop on fire that we have to 
jump to before there could be a conversation about anything else yeah. that we're dealing with. And so, but I think that's like, that is a challenge and a question that I think anybody using the media and how we create those boundaries for ourselves are confronted with right now in this day and age. How everyone does that is, is different. Um, I, you know, I don't want to interpret my words for anyone, but I would just say it's not so important that you know that that really happened but it did really happen. But what does that mean that it really happened? Okay. I don't really, I, I can't explain that. I can say that I would bet I'm one of the only people that saw that. Or I, you know what? I would say that I didn't even see that happen on the screen. My camera saw it happen on mm -hmm. the screen. I was just in the place Great at the point. time. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. And, and that's, it's, that's interesting to me because yeah. that's something about the relationship you have with the way, at least I can say, contemporary city. I mean, this is a place, I'll just talk about it for looking at it as an example, but, um, you know, I always joke that everything about the picture was pre-planned in so far that I knew exactly where I wanted to be, I knew which lens I needed, I knew the vantage point I wanted, I knew I was obsessed with this screen, which is the, sec the largest in the United States until recently. And what I didn't know was what was going to happen on the screen. That's the decisive moment. So the decisive, which is a joke, huh? you know, the decisive moment is what happens in the artificial realm now. Yeah. So that's something that's interesting. But at the same time, I look at the picture, and you know, yeah, to some degree, we're talking about how you see a certain histories in the pictures. I'm not. I embrace that to a degree. Um, and you know, I think about. The way I look at landscape photography that I was that I learned a lot by looking at the interior of this high commercial signage and, and this completely new economic reality that didn't exist a very short period of time ago versus the pre-war buildings of yeah. from the working class. You know, I mean, you know, you, everybody can have their own reaction to it. I will, I will finish because many of you may not know that what you see on the screen, the baby and the, and the, and the father, that's a Skype interview between the child and his father who was a soldier, right? So what we see is triple mediated or double mediated, right? It's a virtual encounter through internet and technology. And obviously what's happening is that the screen within the screen and everything is mediated and removed and no one is looking at that, so, which is a lot about attention, spectacle, the commercially oversaturated space, and something very private, but also ideologically obviously loaded and tainted. The sky can tell you between a US soldier and his baby, right? It all kind of takes this in a strange way. I'm very much taken by what you said, that you didn't know that it's important because it goes back what you said, that you know, when photography became first theorized in the 20s, and the whole idea that photography shows you something what you would not notice, so it rechannels your attention. It makes you notice things which otherwise would pass. Can't say. In this context, I mean, I'm going to sound cynical. I don't mean to sound quite as cynical as I will sound, but in this context, it's also propaganda. Like when you put this interaction's personal, this interaction here next to all of this signage. You know, like, this is this is propaganda, this is advertising, this is about building, it's a, a old function of documentary photography or of social photography is to build empathy for a certain position, even if it's a very noble position. Empathy, respect for the soldier who's separated from his family, pulling on, you know, like, this is Margaret Bourke White, Dorothea Lang and the migrant mother. You know, like it's a picture of family, it's a picture of Bob, you know, a father and his child. It's something very humanistic that we can relate to that's compelling us to be concerned with the plight of our armed forces at who are away from their families and their homes today because of international affairs and conflicts that this country and this national sport are involved. You know, I mean, this is, the function of this is, has uh, old uh, 
has, has a long history, and its placement here has another history as a sign of this kind of propaganda. So in addition to being about spectacle, in addition to being about a decisive moment, I think that's spot on, in, in addition to being, you know, like there are many layers to which we can consider the photographs within the photographs of this Okay, so picture. we can talk about, yeah. I was, you know, while I'm here, I mean, I'll, I'll chime in. I would just say, you know, I'm not reticent to admit that I chose this picture, obviously, for a reason. There's not, yep. you know, I worked in the whole Haiti Stadium when George Bush came and threw out the first pitch. Talk about, you know, 55,000 people and eagles flying and fighter planes yes. going over and the building shaking and German shepherds everywhere and all this thing. Mm -hmm. And it's like, in a way, this is the new, this is a new world. That, that, that building has literally been obliterated, let alone, you know, metaphorically what you could say about that. You know, so what did we do with that energy? I don't know. We built these like hyper-commercial spaces. Where camera, I think you should push your, uh, your possible purposes on your uh, further. This is about propaganda. It is about the salespeople trying to get into some place that people are going to look at because it's about contemporary um, suffering. Um, so that there is a sandwich here about commerciality and, you know, it's a, it's a propaganda sandwich. Yeah. It isn't just that. Yeah. I mean, no, it's two things. One is, one is obviously, I mean, you can think about, you know, advertisements as, you know, the same rhetoric of the image or the logos, right? It's about persuasion. You can think about persuasion in terms of commercialism. You can think about persuasion or propaganda in terms of ideology and war and the military industry. You can think about branding in zillion ways because, you know, the sky pink that you, the logos, Yankee Stadium, which is a brand, of course, the New York Yankees is a brand on its own. And you could think about the city and, you know, the crowds and, um, uh, and then you can still think about another thing, or I can, you know, disembodiment, Skype interview, versus a totally kind of, you know, inauthentic presence of a crowd who is not really paying attention. Uh, so being present and being disembodied. So you, it, it's full of fantastic juxtapositions. And since we're talking about politics, um, I'm quoting someone else. Um, Manal had this sentence in the catalogue. Um, and you said that I want my images to evoke a surprise or a question and critical engagement. So the question is that let's overstep through reality, whatnot, and let's go in there and start thinking about what forms of critical engagement, what kind of discursive content um, do you discover in these images? How can we think about that? Because you are right, I actually enjoy talking about you know, what we have been talking about so far, but this, I think, is a perfect kind of entryway into thinking about well, can I give you my uh, thing about that image? Because mm -hmm. it is, I, I, I mean, I really didn't uh, focus on the branding and that type of thing. For me, it was kind of more an image about sort of desire and the sort of like child wanting to touch, you know, this man on the screen. And then also just sort of like, this is where the object comes in again. Where it's kind of similar in a gallery experience. We can't have that experience with this image. We can't, you know, and I think there's sort of like, but at the same time, a sense of desire is being created in this image. So I, for me, that was kind of the more interesting thing going on, but, where there's these layers that were being removed from this mm -hmm. sort of moment of someone trying to find a moment of intimacy. But we do know, yeah. right, that con con commercialism advertising is about creating desire. It's it is, exactly the same libidinal investment, right? The child wanting to touch and not being able to reach, this is what advertising is about. It's true, that's, that's, a, that's a very specific design. reading about it. I mean, advertising is so many things, unfortunately. It's not just that thing. But mm -hmm. I think in this case, where it's sort of like taking this moment of this child with a parent, which I think is a beautiful distillation of that kind of desire. You know, it's, and you know, you sort of like, you want, but you can't have, you can't, you know, it's like, but at the same time, mm -hmm. you're supposed to be fulfilled by the emotional experience you're having with this image. Do you know, and people are watching, and there's like this sort of spectatorship that goes on in this image. So for me, that's, that's actually what was evoked more in this image. 
And I mean, the advertising, I mean, I think for me, um, maybe I'm just, uh, you know, when it comes to advertising, I actually feel like, okay, this is an important part of that sort of complex, but, you know, I think we can say that about almost any image. There's a brand in it. You know what I mean? So for me, even though that's emphasized, in some ways, it doesn't, it does, it's not the most important part of the image to me. Mm -hmm. So how do you think about critical engagement, discursive content regarding other works? We can say goodbye to Sweet Home, yeah. New Yankee <laughs> Stadium did that already for many people. Sure. So how do you think about that, you know, in relation to other works? What kind of, you know, let's, you know, not think about how it was made, but what the formal kind of features, or what are we, you know, is this a nice place to be surrounded by these images? <laughs> we are already it's uncanny, it's uncanny came to both ways, but um, because I think I, mean, you know, I would say like the let's go back to the beginning with the question of um, when we what is the critical engagement with these photographs? I think that I think that one I would say one of the things that strikes me about them is there's a, a contemporary, I mean, I'm reiterating myself now in different words, but at any rate, there's a contemporary expression, there's an, ex, it, there's an expressionism to the body of work as a whole, and it's a kind of contemporary expressionism, and so you get a sense of, so for example, in Monica's work, I think if I wanted to give a political, contemporary, contextual reading, there's something about the way in which she's taken individuals out of their first context and put them in a new context that heightens our ability to look at them as people who are aspiring to be something who through fashion, through posture, through their, through their outward appearance, and that in a number of her works we're looking at people of various classes who are aspiring to a certain position or status or sense of themselves through their outward appearance, and she heightens our awareness of that, of the awkwardness, of the aspiration, of the, uh, de of the desire for that by disrupting their original context in, enabling us to focus on them visually in a different way, creating some kind of visual distance. So that to me is, that kind of evoking that sentiment is an, ex has a, is an expressionist gesture. And I think that similarly, Her Boye's work, uh, there's something about it that, um, well, it's like that you responded to this m more abstract work by thinking of it as being sensual as a body, as and, and it, it's clearly very object-based, but there's something we could speak of it that even gesturally is having an expressionist gesture to it, but there's something in the heightening of the uh, material, the visual tactility of that burned paint surface, mm -hmm. the cracking burned paint that gives us that expressionism that then becomes dark, that then we can read into it um, a sense of the unknown, that in the unknown often contains darkness in it. Like there's a sense of fear in the unknown. And I think that similarly, Felix's black paintings, which, you know, or the uh, black photographs, referring to Goya's black paintings, um, there's an expressionism to this, like, let's, let's take this, the feeling of being in a mass, of being in a crowd, of being in a, and it being in an ecstatic crowd, like a crowd that's not just, you're not sitting in a really packed auditorium listening to a academic lecture, you're in a fired up, you know, there's, and he, by repeating it, by altering the scales, there's a visual, ex there's an expressionist gesture that creates this sort of visual. I, I do but that. I don't know. Can you want it to be more political? I can no, see no, Agnes no, like, no, why no, think no, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm sitting here and I never been sitting, sitting in this room before. I was always walking in this room before. And the more I look, the more desperate it gets because, you know, 
looking at all the bodies, all bodies appear to be totally displaced. Um, even if gestures of intimacy in her way as triptych appears to be extremely claustrophobic, very secretive, whether these bodies are real bodies or images, you know, there is a certain sense of which I never realized, I haven't realized when I was thinking about these pictures and was writing actually the essay, that there is a sense of total physical dislocation, a kind of desperate kind of being clothed in your own body, which I never noticed before. And um, even Sarah doesn't have bodies in there, but everything which is in there is in the same kind of state. You're waiting for a body to emerge. The lack of body becomes the same thing. So it's a very sad show, you know. It's, this is not a happy show. Expressionism was a dark movement. Yeah, but it's a dark <laughs> era. And it was freaked but out about what was going of, on in the modern world. Is, and is, so was Goya. Is this the dark period too? Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, the the fact that the show is dark just only means that maybe they are paying attention, right? I don't know. Well, I mean, I think definitely you picked up on the whole sort of dislocation. I mean, I think I think part of it is, um, I mean, we're talking about, you know, uh, you know, place. I mean, a little bit like it's sort of they're dislocated because they exist in a space, and we're supposed to sort of exist with them, but there's a total break between their space and our space. You know, and I think I think that's the immediate. I mean, I think alienation is sort of inevitable, unfortunately, in photography in, in many ways. I think so. That that that's why I don't see it as as clear saying like this is so specific to this show. I think the image lives like that in a photo, particularly it's in a about photograph. mediation. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So you know, right. not not having the physical contact, you know, as opposed to when in an photographic regime and someone makes a drawing or painting, you do have a kind of bodily presence in there. Right what you can do something with. Photography is about technological mediation. So right. it's, in that regard, yes, the photographer's body or presence is less there, maybe. But yeah, the dislocation, but also the desperate kind of, you know, fragmentation and loneliness of bodies, whether they are alone or not. So, um, hmm. Wait, is it, yeah. isn't that true of all just throwing an idea and you can run with it? It's the invisible labor, the idea of invisible labor. Just think about it today, underpaid, underappreciated, mm -hmm. invisible labor. And think about the mm -hmm. underestimation of labor in photography. If, a, you don't, if it's a seamless collage, you might not see right. the labor. You presume that it was taken easily. Because if, if, it's, if it's a straight photograph, that you think that it's a snapshot, therefore it's easy. But you have to take thousands of them before you can get a good one. So there's a lot of labor that is right. not on the wall. Yeah. And then when you make it seamless and when you make it uh, you know, digital, the presumption is that it's, a, it's an easy medium. Mm -hmm. Whereas there's so much labor that goes into the collage and then it disappears. Right. And it becomes this shiny, simple thing. And if you extrapolate that how labor works, cheap labor creates this shiny commodity. I mean, the labor part is interesting because people are aware of how the photographic similar clothing magazines and advertising cost a lot of money and take a lot of time. Everyone knows that the few people who are the best photoshoppers who make things appear flawless and totally fake and very virtual illusionistic, those people are spending days on working on, you know, uh, a JPEG file, and they are obscenely well paid. It's a very interesting thing that how we don't want to how do we don't want to kind of you know think about labor when it comes to photography? Maybe for the same reason that we do not see, we don't necessarily imagine the artist kind of involvement or physical involvement with the instrument he is working with. Uh, I don't know. How do you feel about labor, Felix? Because you spend a lot of time, kind of you know, you're slow. It is a slow thing, putting together hundreds, hundreds of images to create, you know, the blacks or either two more peanuts. How do you feel about labor? I think that, uh, I mean, to me, we're having this kind of, you know, we're seeing that kind of already my native Sasha like TV Gonzalez kind of uh, guy that, that actually is an obsessive move, you know, something that it comes from obsession, I think. Um, and it's a filter to me, it's a way to get somewhere where I am actually not capable of having to nail, you know, like a Kafka and a hammer and thing. And, uh, and, you know, actually, Gary says something. I don't know, it's, to me it's 
something that is necessary in that way, so I can actually, I mean, I don't know how to do it, but um, too long, but uh, it, it kind of connects with everything here because, um, and maybe it's in my work, and it's, but I, I wonder what happens if like, we have the same images here, the same content, or the same interest of the art behind which of course it wouldn't exist in the same way, but if everything would have been like drawing, you know, like by this artist, and, and mm -hmm. I wonder if then we would be having the same conversation. I think we would be having the same conversation because the images would look like photographs, and then we would talk about photography, you know? But, <laughs> but the thing is, who, I don't really, I don't know, I mean, I'm not going to talk for a part, but we don't know each other very well, and I don't think we really, you know, they care about it, what happened with us, and I think I'm talking for all of us, but in, uh, the link that is here is that um, we are all pretty kind of impressive people, in a way, like we get impressed with what we are surrounded by, you know, I think we're all sensitive to it, well. and then we kind of can have it and then this, as obsessive as I'm talking about the process of you remember making it, we just go, you know, we one day we discover these little machines that, you know, like do these things and they are so amazing. And then we, as Peter said before, we don't see shit out there, the camera does, and then when we come back home, we are surprised again. And, and you know, in this excitement, you know, I think we encounter in photography or in the way we photograph that the world that we see out there kind of uh, a platform of imagination that anything that we can ever came up with. Of course, then you come back and you have all this education, all this history, and all this sort of business. And, and things get a little more complex so you can take them somewhere because you want to take them somewhere. You want to own it, you know. But what I'm going to say is that um, the whole idea of, of being a photographer, and I know we've been talking about this picture before, and of course, there's a history, but it's funny that in the future, I mean, I think about it, but I think actually the cave paintings, you know, like I think the idea of these objects of desire and the way that it's been put it in somewhere and that the contemporary has, so, you know, so I don't really think anymore of the photographic direction when I see the work of this, of all the people here. Of course, this, I know we're talking about that, it's great and we need to be talking about that. Um, I don't know, I kind of probably not saying that it's, it's kind of a practice, you know, I mean, it's just the way we do it. It's like the material is confused because we understand it that way and we keep getting excited mm -hmm. about it, you know? Okay, I want to ask how many of you are taking pictures when you see something interesting in this room? How many of you are sitting here are taking regularly pictures with, that, with your phone? How many are posting on Instagram, doing Twitter? <laughs> yeah, all Hands up. I don't, I don't. But Hannah, I'm just, just curious. Because it is different. Because what you say, I do get that, you know, that, oh, we just kind of take the little device and go out there and what connects it, that we are all rooted in the real, we are interested in the real. Everyone is interested in the real, except people who don't want to pay attention. Well, I don't think that's what he's saying, though. That's not what he's saying. I'm sorry, I know it's like, I'm not, I've never been very articulate with that. I think, my <laughs> thing is, I'm actually, don't think we are interested in the in, we're not interested in talking and communicating about the real or that real that we're talking about. I think we're using it as a platform of imagination. Yeah. I, think it's, I think we're learning from it in actually, you know, I'm, like, I'm thinking of Picasso, I'm thinking, for example, of Grandma Becky Combe, you know, if we could only see, if we could only see with the eyes and not with the brain, you know, and, and you know, and I think, you know, like talking about Tom Cooper or like Thomas Ruth and like, you know, like, like how his ancestors, you know, like they came to uh, making photographs, the living that they were doing was real. They were talking about something, and his responsibility, the work he did, which is like making a picture, you know, mm -hmm. with photography, you know. And, and I mean, all things kind of, you know, it's all, you know, story, but like this is, you know, what I'm trying to say that, and I know it, I mean, I know it sounds complicated sometimes to me, I think it was, but it's so simple to, but, uh, but it's a complicated dialogue because it's yeah. also what we was saying before, like, I think the most interesting thing about all that is photography is a medium that is always in crisis, always. And the thing yeah. that is accelerating is, uh, sorry, is, uh, is crazy. So there is always so hard to catch up with it. You know what I mean? Because I think it's constant. Because, I mean, we all read, we've all read Susan Sontag, right? And yeah. This is this conversation about what's real, what's true. Yeah. We know this. Yes. And that's why I we continually see photography being presented as photography shows. And at some point, this discourse of, of the way of seeing 
hopefully will transcend to be in a conversation with contemporary art, like yeah. you're saying. Like this abstract composite, we should be discussing it in the context of Kandinsky. We should be discussing it in the context of the energy it's presenting and what are those particles in that photograph? How are they part of that conversation? And I don't know how photography got so isolated. Because it's very interesting my to say. My right? was part of a surrealist movement. He, yeah. was, he was in the salon drawing, and they were writing, and they were taking photographs. And all of a sudden, photography is this isolated field. And it's now, thankfully, becoming more part of the contemporary art <coughs> conversation. But it's interesting, like, I am not in any way an advocate for the art fairs, because I think it becomes like a vacuum cleaner convention, where you're just coming from booth to booth. But it's a very interesting mashup where you're seeing a piece of sculpture, a performance, this fantastic photograph, this painting, this, this, and, and we don't see that in institutions. I agree with that. What makes this even more to a word is that as soon as photography was rebranded as part of contemporary art, which is pretty much the late 80s and early 90s, the first time when we are not referring to artists as photographers, but as artists who just happen to use photography as a medium, right? So this kind of merger of the lot, I'm quoting someone saying that the rebranding of photography as contemporary art, this occurred and then still, interestingly, there is a division uh, which goes along media, which is a very old-fashioned division if you like, right? Um, that, you know, MoMA has a new photography show, they don't have a new painting show, although they just, they just, <laughs> they just had one, yes, <laughs> yes. Yes, maybe they, maybe they should skip that one. Um, but you know, they have new photography. So the interesting thing is that photography still, and that's, that's I think about institutional questions, that photography, there are journals devoted to photography, there are websites devoted to photography, there are still galleries in Chelsea and the Lower East Side who are specialized in photography. So there is this separation, despite photography becoming part of contemporary art, the separation is still reinforced institutionally. Um, and I actually think that some of the work here would be, and I'm not, um, I think it's really interesting to think about contemporary images, urban space, public space, bodies, right? Fragmentation, spectacle, many, many things that we can bring together, what I would call the critical engagement of work addresses. But on the other hand, it's, um, you know, we could bring in many works which would not be photographs, which would help to contextualize, right? The images may be better than the presence of or the images. images help contextualize yeah. each other. So there would be a sort of dialogue which would, could be maybe more informative for the work and the kind of, you know, discursive content and the kind of formal feature the work actually addresses if the other medium would not be photography. Is it difficult? to curate photography in larger works where there's, like if you see a future, a show, you see sculpture, painting, stuff, like, are, do you, are you still bound to sort of just present photography? The institutions are increasingly moving to a more integrated model, and I think that's something that, that was true in the 20s and 30s, you know, most of the figures we think of as the avant-garde photographers of the 20s and 30s were not trained as photographers. Blas Fault was a sculptor, Mahole was a painter, Rinchenko was a painter, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and, and you have a, a unique book brand of, of uh, artists from that era of the West and the Siegel Institute in, in the States who were truly trained as photographers by medium. But an increasing the institution is integrating them. So, by when the new when the new MoMA opens, there will no longer be photography galleries. There will no longer be painting and sculpture galleries. You will see, in fact, only the collection presented chronologically with integrated shows, and that's something that's been rolling out over the last five years, um, five, more than five years now. And so you see things like the Walker Evans show was housed, even though there was it was an exhibition of Walker Evans photographs. The whole room was photographed. It was in the midst of the painting and sculpture galleries so that you understood his practice as he was in conversation. Because, of course, photographers don't live in bubbles, nor do painters or anyone else. They're part of a larger conversation about cultural production. So I think 
In the institution, you see this already, this kind of integration happening in yeah. the current Walter show. You have film yeah. in one room, painting in the next. The Walter collection is just about to open. Uh, and also, yeah. I mean, other museums are doing uh, other things where they're Slowly. doing geographic. Yeah. Yeah. Where now the Guggenheim, a lot of their curatorial positions are based on geography mm -hmm. as opposed to media, which of course is going to automatically change the way they collect. You know, but I, I, I mean, I actually like the fact there are still photography shows. I mean, I, I'm, a, and I, and I think this is where it comes like the whole the many lives of the object, where it's like I think there is a discussion that goes on with photographs with each other that do, don't work the same in painting, that don't work the same even with video to a certain, you know. And I mean, if there is a commonality here for me, it's they, they all have a little bit of a um, I don't want to say commercial sheen, but there's like a there's like a sleekness to them. Mm -hmm. That is, I think, um, you know, like an aspect of photography that I think they're all sort of talking mm -hmm. about, you know, and, and they sort of like, what does that mean, you know, to create an image like that in our culture where it has a very specific meaning, and, you know, it, and I think it sort of evokes this sort of commercial mm -hmm. sensibility mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, and would probably be tied into desire and all these other things, but... When you say sleep, do you talk about texture or light or color? Because I think light, I, I and agree. Light, yeah. light and kind of, um, they all have the, I mean, I have to say that I, I was impressed with the way it was sort of displayed. Like so many photography shows, you sit there and you're worried about glare. <laughs> you know, it's like there's so, there's, and I actually found like it was one of the few shows that I walked into and I was like, wow, it's mostly photographs and glare is not an issue, you know, in, a, in this kind of funny way. Um, but they, so that's where like the surface sort of was emphasized for me. Mm -hmm. Of these images. The commercial, would you agree with that? That, you know, there is a kind of sleekness to them? No. I mean, I, mean, I don't disagree. I just, it's, that's not a significant factor for me. It's, I would say that there's a resolution, there's a saturation and a resolution, even in the black and white work. No. But there's a saturation and resolution throughout the show that evokes the digital that is. To me about this visual tension that I referred to earlier. I do think there's something, I will say that for all the importance of integrating photography in a larger conversation of art and artists as working across media, because of course even when an artist works in one field, Stieglitz for example, as a photographer, he's in conversation with painters and, and, and draftsmen and and printmakers and sculptors. So artists work across media, but there is something particular to media. At a logistical level, photography requires different light levels. It requires different conditions in the gallery. Works on paper require different conditions in the gallery in terms of conservation. And there is something to photographic vision. There's something to painting. There's a, there's a language in the material medium of painting, there's a language in the material medium of photography. And I think that, that it's not to isolate photography, but it's to appreciate what photograph what that toolbox is, what that language is. But I think we should also Yeah. That. I think I just wonder yeah, you're not to finish with medium specificity, but I think that that's a good note. Um, I just wanted to ask if any of the artists wants to add something or any comments or questions. Yes. I was wanting to do both the photography skills and you know painting. Like painting artwork in general just try to aspire to you know the actual real life you know, action photography taking. You know, like you know how y'all feel about you know artwork in general, like painting, painting work in general being makes their ultimately the artwork always try to aspire to what the actual photograph is, you know, the in depth of the photograph, you know. Like, um, um. I think you're referring to figurative work, right? Realistic figurative work. I'm, I'm not sure that, that the general comment painters are aspiring to. So to kind of make things which are as rooted in the real as a photograph is. I would think that that works differently. And anyone wants to follow sometimes up? Sometimes the photographer aspires to be like the painter. Uh, yes, we, we do have that. You know, I look at Monal's work and I so I see so much painterliness in those folds and in the interestingly not in the folds of the body but in the folds of the drapery. It's so painterly, it's so lush, it's so textured. You know, Felix has the you know, especially the black one, but there too. So I think that, that you know that's a kind of cross media thing. 
when despite the specificity of the medium, something takes on qualities which are not necessarily the qualities of that medium which is being used. Yes, there is someone there. Yeah, But you're assuming that, but the thing is, you're assuming that just because people appreciate it, they want it. I mean, and that's not the same thing. 
just because people don't appreciate the high level of commercial, the reality is because we're sort of educated to sort of think of images in different ways, people sort of believe images that are less commercial and sleek nowadays. You know? Do you know what I mean? So there's like a different dialogue going on there. It's not about just appreciating the commercial. It's like, it's, it's much, like if you see an image and it's a little grainier, I mean, the New York Times puts images on their cover now that are not the way they used to be in terms of these sleek images. But somehow those tell a different story. And I think people are conscious of that. So the commercial world is catching up to the fact that people don't just want, do you know, so it's like, I think it's a little more complicated. Yeah, I mean, obviously it's everything. Yeah, of course. But like, like, you know, I think that kind of that's not really what I was getting at so much as what I was getting at is you're seeing in those people that are producing the really high quality, like glossy commercial images, you know, the magazine and the banner ads, and you're seeing their ability or their desire to pay for talent collapsing, and that's starting at like the very top of the pyramid, uh, and kind of like sure. rolling down to people that have grown up with kind of so saturated in so many images that kind of have that feeling and that quality and they are really very aware of all that goes into producing them that they've almost forgotten what's good because they see so much that's pretty okay. Okay. I think, I mean... I'm so the commercial photography kind of, you know, created a level field when we are surrounded by too many, too good images. Um, um, I think it's more what they can get away with. I think it's what they can get away with. I mean, like, I mean, how many artists are asked to do things for exposure? I mean, you know, it's like it's sort of like, well, I don't have to pay this person ten thousand dollars to this sleek image when I can crowdsource it and get four images that are somehow going to be a little, you know, good enough. Do you know? So it's like I don't know whether it's that. I mean, I've heard similar things with sound, for instance, where it's like people are like say, well, we're an ability to create like the most perfect sound, but the reality is. From CDs to like MP3s, the quality of sound actually went down, and that's kind of what we listen to nowadays. And it's sort of so there's that degradation, which I think has to do more with the market issues rather than like our appreciation of something. Peter, want to say something about you know in relation to? Um, I don't know. Just talking about like sleep images. I'm not. I think I understand what you're saying, but how something I could say probably again. I don't want to speak too much, but a little bit, is that I think we're all interested in using this new new cameras in different ways and new technology. Mm -hmm. The simple might sound dumb, but for the sheer fact that it has a, a, an ability to prescribe in a way that cameras couldn't before. And also, maybe for all this talk to him about how people interact with commercial images, now we have, you know, we, we've seen, many of us here have seen it. Uh, progression of how images change and look, but a lot of people are interacting with images where they only know it from being on a screen or in a sleek way or a high mass produced object. And I think many of us here are maybe trying to some degree speak within a certain language, but what are we looking at? We're not looking at the subject matter of commercial images. We're looking at the world itself or the, the, the vernacular. Everyday things, and what is that? How does what changes when you have that experience? I don't know, but I think that's something we're all curious about and trying to trying to explore. Yeah, I'm sorry to take it back to where we started, and I don't actually think it's a very. Uh, I'm interested in in the conversation of how things are made, but I'm I'm curious to hear what you said in the beginning that you going to go back to telling us why you think it's so important. Because it does make for me a difference to know that this actually exists. Um, that there is an experience of seeing the London advertisement and the outskirts of Beirut. I can imagine that. I can make this image on my screen, on my phone even now, right? Uh, it is at hand, but I do think that uh, because I think we all struggle, you know, with the idea of yesterday I watched Inherent Wives mm -hmm. and I have a great, great love for Thomas Pynchon. And Thomas Pynchon is a perfect thing when you think about that. Am I tripping? <laughs> <laughs> or is Am this I the real? <laughs> I think it's on the day. Yeah? Is this the real? Is Thomas, you know, 
Finn, Finn just plays with that in every single novel. That's why it's so hard to read it because for pages and pages and pages, you just you just carry the way by something, and you never know what it is. And I love that tension, and I think that that tension, because that's also a tension of the core of the work, is truly important. But I want to spend time with that work, and not because I'm an academic, um, but I just want to be a good enough viewer, like Winnicott said, good enough mother. I want to be a good enough viewer. I love that. And, um, yeah. A good enough viewer who is who just takes the time and wants to know what it is because it does make a difference for me that this is not a phantasmagoria of a projection, uh, but it is actually something which does exist in the world. You can say that this is a perfect illustration for the total dislocation what global you know globalism is about. That it can be somewhere else, it can be anywhere. It is London in Beirut. I love that it becomes a sort of dialectical image, very literally so. And for, in order for the verb to, to make that, I need to know that it is actually in my root. Am I making, did I explain it articulately? Yeah. And then I saw it too. I respect what you're saying. But my question is, do you want to know after you've been attracted to the image? Or should somebody tell you that it is a big room and what it is? So, because so do I let things speak? I, that's an In other words, for me, as a collector, and I use that very point, I have to be attracted to it and then ask the question. I, when I am told that, and I don't have a great deal of interest, sometimes being told it sparks some interest, mm -hmm. and I will say that, particularly in something like a question of process, which I have very little interest, unless you're telling me that there's something special about me. Um, I do agree with the fact that, you know, it needs to, it has to speak to you, but, you know, I am under an obligation to look at things because I don't collect I, I'm being paid to write and think about art and, and teach it for, you know, talk about art history for students. So I cannot afford to not to spend at least a little time and wait until I have questions. And having questions is a good thing because this is when you start to think about it in a different form. So it's not just the work which has to have a critical engagement, but it needs, you know, viewers who are willing to have a critical engagement with whatever is shown to them which is very different from Instagram or Flickr, and that's why the shows are important, because you know, you Flickr through it, literally. It's a totally different temporality or speed of looking at images. It's standing in front of it, so that's why shows like are important, whether just photo or mixed with other stuff, that you could have the kind of a presence in front of the work. Okay, anyone else? I don't want to one other Yes, yes, I saw your hand, I'm yeah, sorry. Knowing if that's made up or just found changes how you look at it, does it make it less valuable? No. If it's no. It just changes what it means. It changes. So it's not a value judgment. It's not a quality judgment. I don't think that something fully and entirely rooted in the real and something which takes the real as a jumping but point. You know, it's not your word, but like, does it awe you more? It's like, oh, this person imagined this and like, put, the, put that there. And what if they lied and told you it was real? Oh, that's always a possibility. No, this, is where, this is where your intent comes trust. in sometimes, it's trust. Too, Where you're like, just because they tell you something doesn't mean it's real. You know, there you is, know? Um, I don't want to politicize everything I say, but I kind of tend to think that it's, most things are political, right? Sure. And you're talking about an exchange or dialogue between the viewer and the bird, and there is a certain level of trust. Um, and of course, you know, Doano's famous photograph, the couple, couple in Paris in front of the Hotel de Ville, right? Mm -hmm. Making out and treating with a kiss, yep. which used to be taken as the quintessential, more Cartier-Bresson decisive moment than Cartier-Bresson sure. ever been, right? More kind of decisive moment than couple ever been. That was the, the snapshot stuff. 
And then we learned, you know, 15 years ago that it was totally staged, sure. even that for everything, it was like a fashion show. Right? It was like a, you know, early sure. band or... Or like movie. Kappa's images of yes. the Spanish Civil War. Or so whatever, yes, you know, sometimes, like... sometimes there's an intention, I am fine with that, but I think that it's about trust, it's a kind of, you know, it's between two people and an image in between But are you being too trusting of images then? No. No, I don't think I want to say about that. So simply, I think you're going to be some kind of like a, not like a great art, it has to be a god in order to uh, be a filter of your time, be interested in creating something, and come out with something like that if it's not coming from the real world. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I, I, you got to be a god, you know, to, to kind of offer like this theater. You know, like you put all these things together and put all these. I mean, it's almost impossible, you know what I mean? It's, I mean, it's like impossible, you know? And, and then that's what this is all about, you know? It's about... So the real itself can no, be more complex. Like, well, that's what makes it an artist. Exactly. I mean, that's yeah. different. And, and that's what I'm saying, that's what the power of the media and the way these people are using it, I think it's, it's all about, you know, like, you just can't... It, just, it doesn't get that level with other things. I'm not saying it's better or worse, I think, and of course, all of them has all this connotation of the way it depicts reality and all of this parallels and the history of the media and all these yeah. things that get in the way. But that doesn't matter. The thing is like, see, let's say, see the camera, saw this, but it's something that is inherited by her history, by her education, by her experience. This is being a filter. But if she has to really put it together and come up with something like that, I mean, it's, you know, you know what I mean? Like, that yeah. being said, I'm going to be the advocate of the world well for my own, but that's all where I, I think we're all interested. When you think about, as you say, about the history of the period, the critical thing was, you know, Guernica was the most relevant and important image of the entire period of the disastrous time of humanity, yeah. whatever it represented, you know. And, you know, it was photography involved, it was all the things, the bombing was documented, videotaped, everything. Nobody fucking remembered any of those images, they remember the painting. Yeah. And the point that he actually, where the rumors are, he never cared about painting anything, but it became Nika. But you know what? The ideas and the intentions that were back there and those feelings and that's, you know, whatever the color that might go, you know, is the most important painting I've made. So, I mean... Okay, I'm not sure, sure. I'm that's not sure. sure it's a perfect kind of wrap-up unless someone wants to say something. <laughs> <laughs> what you just said, what you just said, the painting was a much better kind of summation or it created a sort of memory trace about Guernica. I'm, 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 I'm thinking it's a little bit self-defeating to finish with that, but let's like just say that there are works, right? Sometimes the made work, sometimes the real, but you know, it does not affect the capacity of something to become the image, a kind of emblem of a period. And I actually do think, after seeing the, so many, I look many, many paintings, and I do think that not just because they are rooted in the real, but also what Mitra mentioned about the contemporaneity, that you know that this is something which could not exist 15 years ago, not just technologically, but in many ways what you see in these images as well. Um, but Guernica, so, for what, whatever it accomplished, was mediated through the photographs. I mean, when I think of Guernica, I think of it in the pavilion, you know, the Spanish pavilion. Yeah. Like, I don't think of it as it's sort of standalone object in some way, so it does but, get mediated that yeah, way. Yeah, of course, it always does, but now I forgot what I wanted to say. Okay, I think that that's a perfect way to finish. Thank you very much for being here. And, uh,